Welcome to Bonehead. Uh, this is Bonehead Weekly, and it is my privilege and pleasure to have one of my favorite writers and directors, Nicholas Meyer, on the show. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Well, now the thing is, so it looks like this Wrath of Khan right behind me that's signed by a lot of people except you, sir, because we've never met. We do a lot of conventions. I do a lot of moderating convention panels and we've never met. It looks like I'm kissing your ass, but it actually is one of my not favorite Star Trek. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And as if you look at any of our other episodes is always right here behind my back. Uh huh. James, did you want to say anything before we got going with the questions? Yeah, I've, I've got to say, I, uh, I, I love the fact that you worked on uh, and wrote Sherlock Holmes stories because I, I'm, I'm a big sure fan right. of, of Sherlock Holmes. I carry uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and all of that with me all the time. You also wrote an H.G. Wells time travel story, and I'm fascinated by that. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. I all apologize right. in advance. <laughs> now we're going to stop kissing your ass and I'm going to get right to it. This is actually one of the better books about working in the film industry. And we've had a ton of screenwriters, directors, what have you on the show over the last four or five, four years. And, and one of the questions I have for you is something that you talked about specifically in the book about your creative process and priming the pump, correct? Mm-hmm. So, of course, the cat would jump up right in the middle with priming the pump. Can you talk a little bit about that? You don't necessarily have that idea till maybe someone introduces that idea and it primes your pump and gets you gets the for lack of a yes, better. Yes, I think what happens with me, uh, with exceptions, there are times when I actually get ideas, but they're not as frequent as uh, one would wish which is to say, uh, I'm not complaining. I have very little complaints, but I am observing that the times, I, I have an idea now, for example, uh, for my what will be my sixth Sherlock Holmes novel. Right. And I'm over the moon because I vaguely thought it up myself, but most of the time, <laughs> I don't think you're giving I don't. yourself enough credit, though. Well, listen, we should uh, digress long enough for me to observe that artists are seldom the best judges of their own work. Agreed. And, and artists lose, in fact, all proprietary authority over their creations once they're finished. We Agreed. put messages in bottles, we throw the bottles out in the world, and we hope somebody will find the bottle and pop the cork and find what is inside. But we're not going to be looking over their shoulder when we do, correcting uh, you know, their interpretation of what was inside the bottle. No, that's not gum, that's gun, or, or, and so forth. Um, so beginning by acknowledging that everything I say in this department has to be taken with a ton of salt, I would have to say that my own self-observation is that I'm a great pillager of other people's ideas. You are a fantastic <laughs> pillager. <laughs> I'm Attila the Hun. You uh, are. I did not think up Sherlock Holmes and Sigmund Freud. I did not think up H.G. Wells and Jack the Ripper. I, I did not think up uh, Star Trek VI, uh, the, uh, the Undiscovered Country. These are instances in which I either read or in the case of Star Trek VI, a conversation took place with somebody who put an idea in my head, my new uh, Sherlock Holmes novel, The Return of the Pharaoh, that will be out in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, that idea was sort of put in my head by my agent. So that's what I mean by priming the pump. Right. By somebody saying, what about this? And I go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then I'm sort of off and running. But I'm not good at that. Or it's rare, because it's rare when I get the other part all by myself it's a fascinating thing like i said this is one of the better 
and a couple of things that you said in here for example towards the end you were talking about hollywood and how it can be a cruel place but you often i find that you have wouldn't necessarily a pleasant disposition but but a very positive disposition it comes out in your writing well somebody once recommend i'm going to turn on the light here uh somebody recommended a general to napoleon said this guy is a very good general and napoleon said i know he's good but is he lucky (laughs) and luck is a is a great imponderable it can be good luck or it can be bad luck but whatever it is um i think that by and large i have been very fortunate to be at right places at right time and to meet i I think by and large more good people than bad Um, at the beginning of my memoir as i recall um i'm talking about uh, Ned Tannen's uh, eulogy for Verna Field in which he yeah. said, well, she was the only decent person in this dirty, rotten, stinking town. And when you go to funerals, you're not in a critical frame of mind. So I'm just sitting there going, yeah, that's right. She was the only one. And, and then afterwards, I'm standing outside with a bunch of other people waiting to go to her place for cold cuts or something. And I hear this voice saying, you know, and if you were mixing this, it would be sort of faded up slowly right. as it impinged on my consciousness. Biggest crock of shit I ever heard. Mind you, I take a back seat to no man where Verna Field is concerned. But I don't think I would have lasted 35 years in this business had I not found it to be also full of some of the most wonderful, kind, generous, creative, loyal people I hope to meet in this or any other life. And that was uh, Walter Mirisch. All right. I have to say that we've had him on the show. And second of, <laughs> because we've, I had to ask him about his Academy Award, but for our fans out there who listening, Verna edited Jaws. She had been editing for years. And just so everyone knows. James. Well, everybody, you know, women in the, in the movie business originally yeah. were the cutters. Yeah. the editors because it was like sewing so it was considered to be women's work and way before you know more sophisticated devices like the avid or whatever um they would hold up the film and go yeah the kiss should last this long they, right. they would they would know margaret booth verna field dd um i'm blanking on i'm having a senior moment that's okay. Uh, I was sitting here just. Edie thinking, Allen. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Now, go ahead, James. I was gonna say I think that's one of the comments that Patton Oswalt made uh, in I think his uh, biography, uh, Silver Screen Fiend, where he talks about his obsession with film, and he said, "Take any great movie, any great classic you love. Know that a woman put that film together," and and that's one of the points that he makes. Um, one of the things I, I, I have to ask about, and I, I, I know you get asked this quite often, but your command of the literary in, in, in referring to these, these giant, uh, giants of, you know, I held this up because you've got Bram Stoker in here, you have George Bernard Shaw, you have all this, and tying all of those characters together in this kind of fictional examination, how do you approach writing that how do you because i I was just sitting there thinking you know those are lives that have been examined at least on some level and you fuse them very well and i'm fascinated by that well just riffing on 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 the west end horror for a moment the novel takes place in the theater world of london where all these people were coexisting And in fact, one of the things that I like about the book, and I like many things about that book, um, is that all those people were doing what they were actually doing in the first week of March, 1895. I believe I've I've got it correct. Um, As for your larger question about process, it's very difficult for me to 
analyze, let alone explicate my process. It's a little bit like fiddling with a Rubik's cube. Yeah. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to look at these two Stephen Sondheim books, look, uh, uh, finishing the hat and look, I made a hat, uh -huh. which are two of them. These are essential books, not because they print all his lyrics, which chances are, you know, anyway, from the shows, it's what it's in there beside the anecdotes, the observations, the remarks, the analyses, which are, these are books that teach you how to think. Yes. And one of the, you know, everybody's process is different. We all get to sleep in a different way. Some people are on their side, some people are on their back, some people use a sleep mask or something, pinch their nose, whatever gets you there is to, you know, and, and you don't get, one thing you don't do is you don't get to sleep by scrunching up your eyes and saying, I'm going to sleep now. You get to sleep by letting go. And one of the things that Sondheim says, which I certainly responded to, was he said, if you suddenly get the urge to go lie down, do it. <laughs> because that's when the ideas come. And, and I, I find that either as I'm drifting off to sleep or as I'm drifting back to consciousness, I, I get ideas. And, and one of the great mysteries to me is where those is where ideas come from. One minute you don't have them and the next minute something fired in your brain and you put things two things together that weren't there. And I don't know. So I, it is like fiddling with a Rubik's cube and sometimes you're fiddling with it while you're going to sleep or fiddling with it while you're awake. Or the other thing I do is take walks. I walk, I don't know, between three and four miles a day. Mm -hmm. And and I carry this little red book and pick up laundry. Well, you see, it just varies from, you know, lines of dialogue to, you know, what if things. Yeah. And it, it, it's just, it, it is a very sort of absent-minded, maybe that's not even the right phrase, uh, process. Another way of, explicating it is to re remember this section in Plato where Socrates is told by the oracle at Delphi that he's the wisest man in Greece and he thinks that can't be right <laughs> so I, I will disprove this by finding someone wiser than myself and he goes to all segments of Greek society and finally gets around to the poets and he thinks, surely these men, and I guess it was mainly men, yeah. um, who write so insightfully about the human condition will prove to be wiser than myself. And he said, I was astonished to find out that the poets were the stupidest people I talked to. They were like, children they were idiots I, I you know they made except when they did their art at which point they appear to go into a kind of trance during which time they take dictation from god and this they call inspiration right the great catch-all phrase so long-winded, somewhat pompous answer here is that I don't know what the hell goes on. <laughs> I'm sleeping, I'm awaking, the rest of the time I sound like a like a idiot. Um, but you do, you go into a kind of trance, you wake up and it's five hours later and you read stuff or or I reread things like the West End Horror, like uh, the new one, The Return of the Pharaoh, and I go, I wrote that? <laughs> when, when did I write that? I have no memory of it. Right. I went into that trance-like place. Yeah. And that's true for me. I don't know if it's true for anybody else, but it, I, I guess it was true for somebody because Socrates was writing about it thousands of years ago. It's an insurmountable question, and only the person who I think has answered it perfectly is Harlan Ellison. And James, where did Harlan Ellison get all of his ideas? Schenectady. 
<laughs> he would he, he he always claimed he sent out for a new six pack of ideas once a week. They'd send them they fresh delivered back to them. Him. They'd send them a fresh batch of ideas from a uh, company in Schenectady, New York. Yeah. I, and so it's an imp- it's hard to answer. David Milch talked about the writer of Deadwood. That, you know, it, a lot of inspiration came from from the research. Like you just, if you research it, if you were, for example, if you're writing about Deadwood and you were looking into South Dakota at that time and you were just volume, yes. the volume, the inspiration would come. Re- research plays in it. You right. know, that, that's a smart answer. I was at, uh, David was for a while in, in grad school at the University of Iowa mm-hmm. when I was there. So th- that's when I first met him yeah. um, years and years ago. I think... I read a lot of biography and I read a lot of history and you just learn a lot of miscellaneous shit and you, and you write things down say, this is cool. And you hang on to it Yeah, for sure. So that leads me to my next question because you you were at the university of Iowa because of creative writing and I'm trying to ask things and I was re-listening to your on Mick Garris has done our show and you're on Mix a few weeks ago and I was re-listening and I don't know that this was answered correctly what was it that bit you now everybody has that story of this was to go into the this great business or this fool's errand depending on how you look at it but what was it that exactly bit you what got you there what was it a movie was it a book was it a combination of things well, it was definitely a combination of things. If I were to trace its total origins, and again, this is me sort of relating anecdotally things, which may or how, how accurate they are. Uh, memory is fallible. That's, That's okay. Uh, so I'm giving you impressions. Um, when I, I'm very old, I was born shortly after the Civil War. And You're not that old, sir. You look great for 55, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, a kid, we didn't, we didn't have a TV, um, and I was taken to the movies uh, when I was about I'm seven years old, and I had never seen a movie. And I had what my father who was a psychoanalyst referred to as a counterphobic response, which is to say counterphobia is when the object feared becomes the object loved. Right. And I ran out of this movie screaming in terror. Um, they were gonna hang Captain McKeith. And um, the fact that it had music, rather than making it less real, made it more real. Yeah. And this, a fairly obscure movie, The Beggar's Opera, uh, cemented my love of Laurence Olivier, of The Beggar's Opera, of the movie, and of movies. Uh, and then certain other films, notably the Walt Disney 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which I still think is probably the best Disney movie ever. Um, and subsequently, the Mike Todd around the world in 80 days in which my life's ambitions were sort of crystallized. I was already a big Jules Verne fan. Uh, and as I say, you can trace it back even earlier because my, my dad used to read me bedtime stories when I was a kid. So Kipling, the just so stories mm-hmm. and the Finn family, Moomin Troll and God knows what all else. But uh, began a lifelong infatuation with language, with words. Um, and then the movie sort of fed into it. So Jules Verne and the movies met head on with 20,000 Leagues and, and later Around the World in 80 Days. And Around the World in 80 Days, which was a roadshow thing, you bought tickets in advance and, and so forth. And um, there was a program that you could buy with it. Uh, uh, you know, I, if, if I, can I walk off screen for a you couple You can do seconds? whatever you like. You go right ahead. We'll sit here. Well, I'll right just here. bring this to you so you can see it. Yes, please. Because I, I still have it. Um, 
how have you kept it all these years? Well, I've kept everything. <laughs> are you are you a hoarder? Are you a pack rat like me? No, I'm just a book fiend. Um, this this you bought this for two dollars. It's beautiful. When you when you went to see around the world in eighty days, and there were a lot of articles about the making of the of the film, and there was one article that more or less changed my my life. And here it is. Do it yourself for our people listening. It's a book about around the world in 80 days and the article says, is called Do It Yourself. But it says other things. It says, you too can make a picture. No previous experience necessary. Perfect. So imagine, you know, I'm 11 or 12 years old when I come across this thing and I've just been like Saul of Tarsus struck blind on the road to Damascus by yeah. a vision which is around the world in 80 days and then this article feeds into it and I said to my dad I said you know I want to make a movie and it says here that anybody can do it and of course not being the sharpest knife in the drawer the movie I wanted to make was the movie I had just seen well yeah but uh, that's 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 how it starts right well apparently I mean it this is how it started for me. That was the answer to your question. And so my dad, for reasons of his own, fell in with this scheme with considerable alacrity. We had an eight millimeter wind up Revere camera. And we spent the next five years on weekends, on school vacations, on summer holidays, splicing in other home movie footage of Europe, making our own version of Around the World in 80 Days, the classic, I assure you. That, um, and, you know, editing it on the kitchen table. Uh, and that's what sort of started me off. We're all three fathers, and I hear that story, and it's just magical. It's a fantastic story because the memories that you have with your dad of doing something together like that have to be wonderful. What did you start to read to your own children then as they were after they were up? born after they were born? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. What did you start reading to them? What did you start to kind of trigger that in their imaginations? Uh, well, I read things like Winnie the Pooh, but I think where I really you know, started flying was the just so stories. Yeah. Um, the sonorous use of language, of words, mm -hmm. which these days has largely been replaced by language as a, as a sort of journalism, as a, a, as a language as information, as opposed to language as poetry. I read you know, a couple or one of the Harry Potter books. And I thought this woman is very good with plotting and she's very good with character, but she can't write. Um, <laughs> the, the language has no life of its own. It is not, you know, she writes like, you know, Nelson DeMille or those James Patterson or something. It's it's you, it's people who write, but they don't even hear what their yes what their use of words is. It's just functional. It's not um, evocative. Yeah, James, you ready for your your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned um, Beggar's Opera and and uh, Lawrence Olivier, I believe. So, did it feel like going full circle when Sir Lawrence Olivier popped up in the Seven Percent Solution? Well, I said before, you know, Napoleon said, but is he lucky? I mean, you yeah. know, it's a hero and you actually growing up yeah. watching, first of all, you, you know, talk about my other formative influences. I had this man crush on Laurence Olivier from the time I'm eight years old. I thought he was drop dead gorgeous. And then he and then he was in this movie. I don't know. It's about 13 or 14 by then which I, did, I thought the name of the movie was Henry V. And the movie, it had, it, it never mentioned Shakespeare, which probably would have scared me off. 
but it had pictures of swords and guys in armor and horses and everything. So I played hooky from school and, you know, and it, obviously this was not first run. This was because it came out, I think, in 45 or something. But this is like 1962 or something when I see it. And I have this religious experience. I understand, okay, this is the best movie. This is the best writer. This is the best actor. And I'm never reading another Shakespeare play. Not until I see it first. Um, I was 21 years old with the first time I saw King Lear. And I was the only person in the audience who didn't know what was going to happen next. Because I didn't know. Um, and so if you had said to me after I saw Henry V, Henry V, sitting in the movie theater from like two in the afternoon till midnight. My parents had no idea where I was. There was no phone to let them know. I was fuck them, I didn't care. <laughs> I just was sitting there hypnotized by this movie, what movies could be, what Shakespeare turns out to be, what all of it. And if you had said to me, and one day that actor is going to be speaking your silly dialogue. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't have made it wouldn't have made any sense to me. It barely made any sense when it was happening. Hey, this, this is the only business where you get to shake hands with your dreams. Yes. If you're lucky. Yeah. Do, could I know Pete, he wanted people? Did you could you call him Larry? Uh, could you get I to that point? Technically. Technically, you could call him Larry, but yeah. I wasn't about to. That's what um, I was about to say. I know he asked people to call him that after there was a little bit of formality out of the way. But I mean, could you ever? Nora Kay, who was the wife of the director, Herb Ross, she used to refer to him, and I think it was sort of behind his back, as Lordy. <laughs> uh, she's like, she called him Lordy. Uh, and I I do remember my other Olivier story. He was he was on the movie for three days, and I just was like following him. I, I lunched with him every day, and he was quite nice. And and then I went into a big depression when he he uh, left the film. Um, but then he came to Los Angeles to do Marathon Man, and we were in sort of fitful contact and I get a message on my, you know, voice tape as it then was, you're invited to lunch with Laurence Olivier Saturday, 12 noon, informal. So I thought it was him and me. And I show up in jeans and sneakers and his social secretary answers the door and she goes, oh my, you're the first one here. And I was like someone who had admit, been admitted to Mount Olympus by mistake, because all these people start showing up. Eddie Albert, Vincent Price, Carl Brown, Andre Previn, Warren Beatty, Dustin Hoffman, um, Henry Fonda, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Ray Milland, be, because he, he was not entirely well at this point. Yeah. And when I... When I spoke with him b back in, in, in England on the movie, he said, where are you from, dear boy? And I, he always called me dear boy, and I realized he, he didn't remember my name. Um, and I said, Hollywood, and he said, oh, Hollywood. Back in 1939, Viv and I, we were the king and queen of that place. Um, I had just done Wuthering Heights, and she had just done Gone with the Wind. They couldn't do enough for us. So now here he was back in Hollywood for the first time in uh, who knew how many years. And he couldn't go out to people. So we just had this one big party. And I wandered around, as I say, like somebody admitted to Mount Olympus by mistake. And just hearing these and seeing all these people that you just dreamt about or watched with your mouth hanging open while you were chewing popcorn. Has... I was to say, you mentioned Vincent Price, and I automatically was like, oh, because he was my childhood. My mother introduced me to, you know, 
everything Vincent Price did when she was younger and I was obsessed. He was a Southerner, wasn't he? Wasn't he from? Yeah, he was from Missouri originally, but he, he had that great ability just to to put forth that voice of, I don't know, there's just something about it. And, and probably at some point my mother just had a crush on him and she never told me that side of it, but. Well, uh, and Chad just showed up and he might be able to say a little more. I think he actually came from a privileged background, correct? Yeah, his, 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 uh, Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we're um, all at work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as you can see with my my wonderful work hat. Um, no, uh, he he uh, his family owned a candy company. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a candy kid. There's a great photo of him from the 19. Yeah, he was the he was the candy spokesperson for a long time. He was the, the I forget his nickname, but he was like the candy kid. Not that you needed to know any of that, Mr. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was always been sort of slightly curious about him. I, I for some reason I thought he grew up in Alabama. I'm not sure why I had this impression. Um, I know he had a great art collection and he had a wonderful, amazing wife, uh, mm -hmm. Coral Brown, Yeah, who was in a way, at least as, if not more interesting, certainly to me, than he was. And, and, uh, and a wit and, a, and an enormous talent. Um, and there, there are two things of her on well the killing of sister george obviously but um she was in a movie called dream child which is a, an amazing movie i think it's written by dennis potter um and it's she plays alice liddell as a grown-up lady mm -hmm. and alice liddell whom as you may recall was the little girl about whom alice in wonderland was written by mm -hmm. lewis carroll and in Dream Child, she is really sort of sick of having been grown up with this label of, of being Alice. But in this story, she is invited to New York, to Columbia University, to receive an honorary degree there on the centenary of Lewis Carroll's birth for having been um, the little girl. And she's sort of an angry, irritated woman with all this, but she is put up in somebody's pre-war Central Park West apartment. And as she approaches this ceremony, memories of Lewis Carroll and the characters as embodied by Jim Henson puppets start emerging from the closets of this anonymous place she's living in and it's about her coming to terms with being Alice. And I seem to remember sobbing all the way through this film and just thinking, whoa. Um, and then the other story, of course, is the story about how she met Guy Burgess. Um, she, she was playing in a production of Hamlet in Moscow you know this story. You know. No, it. no, we're 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 happy. We're, we're we're we love the history. So please keep going. Well, she was playing Michael Redgrave's mother. She was Gertrude to to his Hamlet in Moscow, and she goes, and me, only two years older than him, was playing his mother. <laughs> um, and apparently, after one performance, reeling into the dressing room, really drunk, was this Englishman who said, oh, the words, the words, the marvelous words. And then he threw up all over the place <laughs> and they carted him out. And the next day, she got an invitation to take tea at his Moscow flat. And it was Guy Burgess. And she said, I'm not a political person, mm -hmm. but I have an actor's curiosity. So she went through these labyrinth of housing complexes in the dead of winter in Moscow, being shadowed by the KGB the whole time she was going there and finally came into his ratty apartment while he was making tea, wondering why he wanted to meet her, see her. And it turned out that what he wanted was for her to take back his measurements to his tailor in Savile Row. 
because he couldn't get a decent suit of clothes, you know, now that he was forced to live the rest of his life in Russia. Yeah. And at yeah. one point, she, he said to her, you don't like me very much, do you? And she said, well, you did piss in our soup, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, anyway, she came back to England at the end of this crazy encounter with the suit. And she told the story to Alan Bennett. And Alan Bennett made it into a play. And the play is called An Englishman Abroad. And Coral Brown played herself. And then they made it into a movie. Uh, John Schlesinger directed it. It's called An Englishman Abroad. Very hard to get hold of, I think. And Alan Bates played Guy Burgess. It's pretty good. Anyway. Now, there's two it. things now that you've given me that I'm going to have to look up. Same here. It's Which is what? The, the last two movies, uh, An Englishman Abroad. I'm not familiar a little bit with the story, but I've never actually seen the picture. And then the, then the, the Alice. Dream Child. Dream Child. Okay. And then the Alice one. I've not seen that one. That's Dream Child. That's Dream Child. Dream Child. Yeah, I've not seen that. I don't know how I've missed it. Ian Ian Holm plays Lewis Carroll. Right. Wow. And yeah. Jim Henson does the puppets. All right. Damn it. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. So we don't, I don't, we all love Trek. And I know you get asked and we're, we're always trying to pride ourselves in asking questions that you don't get hammered with all the time. And, and I'm sure James. Go, go for it. No, <laughs> James is the big Trekker out of it. I, and I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of the cast and I do love Trek. But the thing is for us as film geeks that I could not wrap my mind around is how you did not wait to take credit for writing Star Trek 2. I get, the, I get the timeliness of it, but I don't blame your agent for being pissed at you. <laughs> well, that's it. I know that's I think a, I was trying to pretend to myself that uh, it wasn't really happening because if it didn't work, then it wasn't on the record that I was, you know, I, I don't think I thought it through in that much detail, but in a kind of incoherent way, um, I also felt, and I still feel, that if I hadn't said, let's get on with this, that there wouldn't have been a movie, or at any rate, it wouldn't have been a movie that I'd been involved with. Yeah. Because they booked the thing into theaters. Right. But you also had no idea that you were, as, and please I take this compliment, that you were about to make the one of my favorite motion pictures, but the best star trek film yes the definitive star trek film the definitive. especially especially going off star trek one where you know star trek two is completely different than the first one plain and simple well let me made it not associate for a moment yeah number number one i'm not among the people who knock the first movie because somebody had to go boldly um which, by the way, is not English. It should be boldly. You have to go boldly. You can't boldly go. Um, <laughs> somebody had to go boldly yeah. where no one had gone before and try these things. Um, I'm sure that I learned a lot from watching the original movie and also, for that matter, the TV shows about things I that I didn't want to do and and sort of guideposts, some of them positive and some of them negative, about what was going to inform it. The other thing I want to jump in and just, because somebody used the word definitive. I do not believe that the word definitive ever believe, belongs in a, in a discussion about either art or biography. I don't think there can be a definitive biography. Um, biographies are collaborations yeah. between a painter and a sitter. The sitter could be willing or unwilling, you know, witting or unwitting, could be alive, could be dead. But if you ask three artists to paint an apple, you will not get a definitive apple. You will get an apple by Renoir, 
an apple by Rembrandt and an apple by Giacometti, but it will be three different visions. And I think, I don't mind being called the best Star Trek. I'm happy with that. Well, you are the best Star Trek. Uh, if that, if you know, wh whatever. But uh, the word definitive slightly I bump on. Um, How about people, the most influential? So you, far. You are second to Roddenberry as having the most, some of the most influence on where Trek was going. I'll take it. You were. You just made it more and more nautical and you made them, I, well, I could, the rest of this is kissing your ass, but like I said, to get back to the original question about the writing, you just didn't know, right? Well, I had other models in mind and they weren't Trek. Yeah. Uh, I had two models in mind, one of which I don't think I was aware of for the next 25 years until it suddenly you know, this goes to another topic, which is the topic of influence. Mm -hmm. What influenced you? Who influenced you? And the problem with this, why I find it su such an interesting question, is that most of the time, or much of the time, we don't know what we're being influenced by. You absorb influences from the ether, and you don't know, you don't realize that you've taken something on board um maybe you never realize it mm -hmm. you also are aware when people are asking you in public for the record who were your biggest influences and then it's about how you present yourself and even if you're trying to be honest you know and you want to say well it, it sounds really cool you know so i'll say i was i was influenced by robert bresson <laughs> you know whereas really i was you know it was scooby-doo um <laughs> But yeah. that doesn't quite sound as, you know, whatever. So you, you are um, engaging in a kind of instinctive mythopoesis, um, which may or may not be helpful. That said, I was influenced by the adventures of Captain Horatio Hornblower, the C.S. Forrester books, which I read when, about the same time I was reading Sherlock, and I was 12 years old or something. Um, but I was also, and this is the one I sort of buried from myself for years, was a, a, a movie, one of my favorite movies called The Enemy Below. Mm -hmm. You ever see The Enemy Below? I've seen parts of it and I know of it. Parts. Well, parts. well I, I... my advice to you is don't sleep. Don't okay. sleep until you've seen The Enemy Below. No one ever remembers who directed The Enemy Below, which is wild. It's a great trick question. It was... Uh, Dick Powell directed it. And it's a duel between the dis a destroyer and a submarine. Mm -hmm. And the captain of the destroyer is Robert Mitchum, and the captain of the submarine is Kurt Jurgens. And, you know, I hadn't even thought for the longest time. I used to think generically that I was dealing with submarines and, or, or ships or something. But this, turned out I realized much later was, oh yeah, because I saw the movie again and I thought, oh yeah, you, you helped yourself. With the, uh, one thing that occasionally gets brought up on, because uh, I'm a big Star Trek nerd, uh, but one thing that occasionally gets brought up is th this, this idea of is Starfleet military, is it explorative? And some people point to, well, you know, Star Trek II started to make it look a little bit more military-based because you have the back and forth with the Genesis being the scientific and who actually controls it. Was any of that, you know, did you have a plan of where that's going to go or 20 years later starting to debate what that looks like? Well, once people pull the bottle open and start reading what's inside, you're you're not going to be there. My opinion about any of this, at going back to the fact that artists lose all proprietary authority over their creations when they're finished, it's just another opinion. It, 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 I'm not the answer to a book of math equations <laughs> at, at the back. Um, what I remember, and my memory is fallible. People said to me, 
did you have any interaction with Gene Roddenberry on your Star Trek movies? And I said, for years. Uh, I, I said, well, I, I met him. I know I, I, I met him on two. You sort of went and kissed the ring. Um, but I don't, I, you know, he wasn't involved with the movie, with the production, which he wasn't. But I was back at the University of Iowa many years ago where they keep my papers. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded to be shown a lengthy correspondence between me and Roddenberry over the screenplay of The Wrath of Khan, which he hated. Um, and he kept insisting that Star Trek, that the Starfleet was not a uh, military was it wasn't a military it was like the coast guard was as yeah. close as he would come and i was just you know a brash kid and i said well i mean who are we kidding this is gunboat diplomacy in which the americans read the federation read the white people are basically in charge and uh, you know i don't think it's i, I don't know I, I didn't think i was doing that much violation to his world and I wasn't you know at the time maybe maybe now I'm willing to concede that he he did believe in the perfectibility of humankind um I don't for the simple reason I I see no evidence of it um so anyway um we had that we locked horns on this and I did it my way because no one was paying any attention. So I got to pretty much until it was finished, until they saw it. And then everybody started having plans for it. Right. Which and for the franchise. Yeah. And As, I didn't even know what a franchise was when I started. <laughs> then the changing of the actual ending of how thing the Spock was going to play out. Yep. Um, I'm curious, did you read these letters before you started to work on Discovery? No. I wonder if that influenced you at all. No, I did not. This was this was more recent than that. I mean, some of these things are, you know, so long ago that they get telescoped. Mm -hmm. But no, I had no memory of it. I do. I remember our interactions on Discovery, another screenplay that he hated because it depicted the a crew of the enterprise as subject to racial prejudice as anybody else or xenophobia mm -hmm. really they 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 talked about how the klingons all looked alike and how they gave off a smell and things that were were profoundly offensive to him and i was in a meeting with him um and he was unwell and in fact died uh, 3 days i think before the movie opened Something like that. No, he died three days after. Three days after he saw the movie, Undiscovered Country. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I don't think I was very polite. I don't think I was very tolerant. I had the bit between my teeth at this point, and I, and I had was having so much difficulty getting this movie made amid uh, mysterious financial stuff that was going on and at one point the movie got canceled i had a lot on my plate mm -hmm. but that's an explanation it's not an excuse for the discourtesy i think i showed him in those meetings it was i don't look back on it as my finest hour and a half it's kind of interesting though because uh, you know Roddenberry being concerned, I'm sorry, concerned about that, but yet, and it's played endearingly, but throughout the original series, McCoy says what would be considered horrible, horrible things to Spock, you know, calls him green blooded hobgoblin and all that stuff. So it, it, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it's one of the things that when I go back and I watch, and I'm now watching it with my children and, and things like that, it's one of the things that when we talk about this as star trek has evolved it's interesting that you know in in the 1960s television series there definitely were tones of i mean mccoy is an easy one to point to because he always had comments towards spock about 
his heritage and things like that. But there seems to be, it, it would seem an odd argument for Roddenberry to make that people would still make these comments, you know, in, in the undiscovered country. So that's interesting. I, I, I can't ex explain what he was mm -hmm. thinking. I can only report it. Yeah. yeah. And again, report it with the caveat that memory is fallible. All right. But there were a lot of other people in that room at the time, <laughs> I can tell you. So I, in the interest of time, I want to talk about a comedy that you make that I don't think enough people talk about. If you're listening, I'm going to hold up my original one sheet of Volunteers, sir. And I know it wasn't on your list of preferred subjects, but I've got to ask you about Only Volunteers. Only because I forgot it. I was, you know, I, yeah, and, and I think it's a funny movie. Before you, before before Joe chimes in, I got to tell because it's amazing that we were able to book you now. Um, I just introduced my wife about three weeks ago to volunteers. She had never heard of it. I'm like, it's Tom Hanks. You love Tom Hanks and it's John Candy. And she's like, okay, I'll watch it. And, and getting my wife to watch a movie, sir, is like pulling teeth. I'll just be like, she's, she's not really, she's not a cinephile like the rest, of, like I am. She sat down and could not stop watching it and loved it from the moment it started till the moment it ended. So, oh, great. That's lovely. Yeah, she Thank truly you. loved volunteers. So I'm glad Joe's asking his question. So go ahead, Joe. <laughs> well, my question was, is, and before, and I had, I was meeting with an employee right before this and I was like, well, I got to change shirt and put on a hat. And I had, I was like, I've got to grab the poster to show him that I actually love volunteers. Anything you want to talk about with it, you, it. It's not something that you go in great detail in a lot of interviews. So anything you'd like to say, working with John Candy, Tom Hanks, Rita Wilson, doesn't Tim Thomerson, who I think is hilarious in that movie. Yes. Yeah, he is wonderful. He's wonderful. He's as mad as a hatter. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I, we've heard stories from other folks. We've never had the privilege of interviewing. Mike's my knife. Um, <laughs> also, quote the I quote the people's blah blah blah, and the people uh, and people just don't even know what the hell I'm talking about when I say it. Till I've kind of stopped doing it in polite conversation. <laughs> Volunteers was was a joyful and joyous experience in my life because um, about a year before we rolled, probably a little less, I had, well, it's about a year, I had met and fallen in love with my wife. And I think I read the screenplay on our honeymoon. Um, and uh, so this was the first movie that we, that I made as, as this very happily married man. And I had su such a wonderful time doing it, but in retrospect, I think sometimes maybe too wonderful. Um, I, th I think that I threw everything that I thought could be funny into the movie, whether or not it really belonged in the movie. Um, I remember the screenwriters uh, Ken Levine and David Isaacs were horrified when the characters started reading their own subtitles uh, at one point in the movie because this really broke the convention in which the rest of the movie was was made in which the camera does not exist etc. Uh -huh. um, so I think it was a somewhat undisciplined approach. I've never I, I, I never got the chance to uh, film another comedy. Uh, I, I stopped directing in 1993, more or less, when my wife died and I, and I mm -hmm. had two children to raise. Um, but I think if I had done another comedy, I would have been a little more disciplined about what I was doing. I just think I thought, oh, if it's funny, I don't care how or why it's funny. You can just put it in. I was, that's what I mean by having slightly too good a time. Henry James said that life is hot, but art is cool. No. If you are the puppeteer, you cannot be out front sobbing or in the case of volunteers laughing at the performance. You must stay behind the scenes dry eyed and make sure that the strings do not become tangled. Which relates to a story you've told before about the actual filming of the death of Spock, not to go back to Star Trek, right? That the crew was visibly upset. 
during the film? Yeah, everybody but me was crying. The it's cameraman was crying. I mean, everybody was crying, and I, I didn't know what they were crying about. I mean, I was just there to do the job, and may, <clears throat> as going back for a moment to Robert Bresson, who was a kind of influence on me, he said, "My job isn't to find out what the public want and give it to them. My job is to make the public want what I want." And I think that my job was not to cry. My job wasn't even to make the actors cry. My job is to make the audience cry. And for that, I had to be cool and pulling the strings and making sure they're not tangled. Art is manipulation. And the only times we decide when it's bad art is when you're feeling like you're being manipulated as opposed to things proceeding organically. People said, oh, you can't kill Spock. I said, sure, you can kill him. It just depends on whether you kill him well. If, it's, if it seems organic, if it seems inevitable, if it seems like it had to happen, no one's gonna kick. But if they perceive that we're working out a clause in Leonard Nimoy's contract, then they're gonna throw things at the screen and they'll be right to throw them. Yeah. I didn't know anything about his contract, by the way. I just, I just was making the movie. And making the best damn movie you could. Always. Always, yeah. Now, and back to volunteers, not to jump, but that's what makes it so special is your voice is all over it. So, so much we see without a singular voice, but I think volunteers has that certain sense of humor throughout it. So you accept it, or at least I, Chad, we, we accept it when it happens. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. you're welcome. But, and I think going jumping around a little bit again, but talking about just overall, and I, I, I do not claim to uh, uh, be an expert on everything that you've worked on, but one of the things as I read and then later reread the West End Horror, um, and I thought about it in comparison to the death of Spock and things like that, you approach death visually and written in a very, um, the, the antagonist of the West End Horror his death scene as it plays out is he's the villain, but it's very tragic. And it's, there, there is that sense that you do want better for that person. And I think you capture that so well. Is there a way that you approach these final scenes for characters or is it just organic from what they come from? I think the best villains are the ones that you can somewhere agree with. Mm -hmm. They're the most challenging. Um, I was once working on a James Bond picture and they said to me uh, two things. They said, um, what does the villain want? And remember the villain has already wanted the golden Fort Knox, control of the atom bomb, mm -hmm. control of outer space, control of the oceans. And two, Make it simple. Um, so I created a villain who meets up with Bond and he says, you know, all the obstacles that you've gone through to get here. Yeah. Mr. Bond. That was just a test. That was just a test to see if you were the man for me, sir. Because I think when you get to know me, you'll find out that fundamentally I'm a people person. There's too many of them. <laughs> and he goes, he flicks on his monitors and you see every image of overpopulation that you could possibly see. Famine in Ethiopia, traffic jams in LA, you name it. I'm willing to discuss something that no politician will even consider but even lemmings, Mr. Bond, even lemmings know what to do when they grow too numerous. Will you help me save planet Earth? 007, that's, that's some kind of license, isn't it? Tell me, how much game are you allowed to bag with that license? Well, you know, I pitch this thing and Bond says, yeah, you're right, I'll help you. And the, and you know, 30 people in the room where I'm telling this are going, 
I got with their jaws hanging up. I the said, broccolis are not going, they're not on board for that man. <laughs> but but that but everybody at that moment was totally, totally swallowed. I said, don't worry. The smart people will know he's not going to help him. And the stupid people are going to be surprised when he doesn't help him. He says, man, you can't lose. <laughs> um, and but the next day when I came back, it was gone. Why? Too serious, too real. They didn't, you know, Bond is a cartoon and they didn't want anything other than a cartoon. Um, but there's a villain that would really put Bond on his metal. You'd have to be good to figure out why he was wrong. Uh, oddly enough on my bookshelf, I've got Bond books as well. And, and so you, you now have touched on all the icons that I, I loved growing up. You've got Bond, you've got Sherlock Holmes, and you've had Star Trek. So this has been phenomenal for me. <laughs> well, we, and we now I'm talking about my own nuclear war movie. Well, that's actually our next question. I was going to let Chad go ahead and take that because I'm fascinated of how a v lifelong liberal got that Republican to make changes in his head. I wasn't planning on it, I can tell you. Well, no, but it's a very lucky mistake, back to luck, or a very lucky situation. Which now Donald Trump has undone since he walked out of the treaty. Past that, you did your bit for God and country. So do you want to talk about it a little bit so our audience knows about the- Well, we're talking about a television movie from 1983 called The Day After, mm -hmm. which uh, talked about a nuclear war a nuclear exchange of missiles between the United States and the then Soviet Union. Um, and it was it, basically the idea of the movie is to show people not in Washington, not in uniform, not as policy makers, but uh, people in Kansas City and people in Lawrence, Kansas, just as regular people who are going about their business and then they get nuked and that's the end of the movie. Um, and it's saying for anybody who's interested, if you have a nuclear war, this is what it's gonna be like on a good day. Mm -hmm. it, we didn't even show as bad as it could be, but because we thought, well, people will switch the channels. I didn't think anybody was gonna watch it. Um, I sat there with my girlfriend, soon to be my wife and said, you know, be honest. If this wasn't mine, would you be sitting through it? So we were both rather astonished the next morning to find out that 100 million Americans had watched the movie, making it for all time the most watched movie ever made for TV. Yep. Yeah, and, uh, and in a percentage wise, it was 62% of the viewing audience in our country watched that. I mean, that's phenomenal. Would have been a great night to rob a bank. <laughs> 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 I love the fact that that's what you thought about and you just said it out loud. <laughs> but let you you changed Reagan's mind, right? You watched the movie. This is true. I, I as I say, it was the last thing I expected. <clears throat> the day after, the day after, mm -hmm. uh, the press went running around with their microphones, asking people if their minds had been changed by the film and then came as I thought rather gleefully back to me to say well according to our morning after survey your movie didn't change anybody's mind one way or the other about nuclear war what do you have to say <clears throat> and I said well I think it's a little early to see if people change their minds overnight a b would they admit it to you if they did c um, do people know what they really think about things anyway, or just what they say they think or think they think? Um, I was making the best case I could to justify the, the, their morning answer survey. Um, and, but I think I was m more right than not. Nobody wants to say, oh, I saw a TV movie and I changed my mind about nuclear war, uh, unless as it turned out, <clears throat> you were Ronald Reagan who had come to power believing in a winnable nuclear war. Right. And who was so shook up 
by what he saw that he wound up going to Reykjavik, meeting with Gorbachev and signing what turned out to be the Intermediate Range uh, Ballistic Middle, uh, Missile Treaty. Um, he almost signed away a lot more. He almost signed away everything, mm -hmm. but he refused to give up his, uh, what was it called? Star, Star Wars. Wars. The strategic Defense Initiative. Um, he, he clung to that. But anyway, that was like the most worthwhile thing I ever got to do with my life, up, at least up to this point. Maybe this interview will you know, it's be more worthwhile. Oh, uh, <laughs> you're full of shit, but we appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate yeah. it. Talking to three rednecks in Kentucky. We yeah, talking to a guy with a cartoon piece of corn on his hat. <laughs> right. My my late wife was from Kentucky. Where at, sir? Lancaster. Oh, uh -huh. that's not far from us. Well, she was there anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you spent a lot of time in Kentucky? Not a lot, but, uh, you know, between my wife and my friend Tom Rickman, who wrote Coal Miner's Daughter, mm -hmm. and Abe Lincoln, uh, I have a lot of uh, respect for Kentucky. I've, I don't know that I've forgiven the Mitch McConnell, but uh, they're definitely a place to be reckoned with. No problem. That's okay. We, uh, we continuously fight against what I like to call him the pip pickle sucker. Uh, and you got to remember that we live in Lexington, this little blueberry and amongst all the red. Got so, it. No, I listen, I would Lawrence, Kansas is the same college towns, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and capitals and stuff. Austin in Texas is very Austin blue. Is a great example. Yes. Yeah. So I, and I'm back to the interest of time. I, one time, Philip Roth, what's, what draws you to that? Like the human stain, elegy, these are the movies that you've written. What draws you to the work? Well, it's gotta be a part of what draw, draws life. me was, was the opportunity to adapt it. But I, I, sh I think independent of my adaptations, whatever one thinks of them, um, I think you can make the case easily that Philip Roth is one of the great American writers of the last hundred years. And what one learns from Philip Roth, besides what's actually in the books, is that being an artist, the name of the game of being an artist, and maybe this is a good place to end, is showing up. You, you come yeah. up to bat and you swing for the fences. And Philip Roth didn't always have a hit. He didn't always get a man on base. He didn't always get a double, but he kept swinging. And sometimes he hit a home run and sometimes he hit a grand slam. I think the human stain as a novel is a grand slam. Mm -hmm. uh, I think American pastoral is probably a triple, um, but there are some books, you know, that are flawed masterpieces. Huckleberry Finn is probably the great American novel until the last couple of chapters when he didn't know how to wind it up. He was like a man performing an appendectomy on himself in an overhead mirror and things got a little complicated and say, well, maybe I just better, you know, Tom Sawyer this up. Uh, and so it, it, it isn't, uh, uh, my girlfriend and I are reading it out loud every night. So it's on my mind. Um, sometimes flawed masterpieces are, are more interesting than, you know, when a, when a work of art is perfect, you kind of critically, you slide down this impenetrable surface without being able to get a handhold. The Huckleberry Finn and Daniel Deronda, and which, which is obviously George Eliot, not Twain. Mm -hmm. um, though they're flawed, but they're brilliant. They're brilliant. And their brilliance is maybe sometimes set off by their flaws. Uh, I think American pastoral falls into that category. Yeah. Anyway, I kind of got to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've thank been you. fantastic. We can never thank you enough for your time. This has been Bonehead. Thanks.
Uh-huh.